Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Football's back, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also, here is John Schnepp. I'm a highlight type of dude, so, you know, <laughs> it's like Discs of Tron. You know what I'm talking about. Also here... Is Mark Ellis looking fabulous? That's a nice looking jersey there, mm. uh, Mark. For, for those of you who maybe didn't see the show yesterday, Mark is a big uh, fan of the Washington Redskins. Yep. Josh McCook is a big fan of the uh, Steelers. <laughs> and they had a bet since the two teams played last night that the loser would have to wear the other person's jersey. And look at that jersey. Look at <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Busting out the stripper moves. <laughs> the wild man. So apparently, uh, the, the, how'd your team do last night, Mark? Not well, John. Not well. <laughs> so is that Makuga's jersey that you're wearing? Is that what's going on? It's not my jersey. Uh, okay. I'm just asking. It's a little, a little loose on you. That's awesome. All right. Let's get going on first story of the day. All right. At TIFF 2016, Adam Driver was doing press for his latest project that Jim Jarmusch directed Patterson when Collider Steve Weintraub asked about the script for Star Wars Episode Eight, written by Ryan Johnson. Driver said, it's great. It's similar to how The Empire Strikes Back has a different tone. For that, people always go, oh, it's dark. But I don't know that it necessarily is. It's just different in tone in a way that I think is great and necessary, but also very clear. He trusts that his audience is ready for nuance and ambiguity. He's not dumbing anything down for someone, and that's really fun to play. Star Wars Episode Eight opens in theaters on December 17, 2017. John, what do you think about Driver's comments about Episode Eight's script? I, it kind of feels to me, and, and look, I might be reading way too much in this, all right? It kind of feels to me, like when he brought up the Empire Strikes Back comparison, that a little bell went off in his head. It's like, do you know what kind of firestorm you're starting by comparing this to Empire? <laughs> and he starts to back down. Not, not, not necessarily saying, but look, we knew when you have a director like J.J. Abrams, who I think did a great job with The Force Awakens, and then you switch gears to a director like to a guy like Ryan Johnson, mm -hmm. right? You are going to get a different style of movie. You're going to get a different tone. And I think that's why a lot of us who are Star Wars fans, we were really excited to hear the name of Ryan Johnson being attached to that second film because if they follow the pattern of the original trilogy, and so far they sort of have, then you know in the second chapter, things don't necessarily go all that well. And for a guy to bring in that sort of a perspective, Ryan Johnson's a guy. I really like hearing Adam Driver say this. I like hearing him say, this is a different tone, and it should be a different tone because the chapters have changed. We've gone from the universe being in one state, now the universe is in a different state, and therefore the tone should be a little bit different. We now know these characters. We've been introduced to them, now we can delve deeper. We know what the story is, now we can see the new angles and dimensions that it takes. So I personally really, really like these comments. Mark, you heard what Adam Driver had to say. What do you think? John, you did what every Star Wars fan should do. You read way too much into these comments. But that's what we enjoy doing, and especially when somebody <laughs> drops the name Empire Strikes Back, we are automatically going to think, oh, wait, whose hand's getting cut off? The bad guys are going to win. Are people going to die? Somebody going to get frozen in carbonite? And I think that Adam Driver started thinking that as well as he's explaining this. I think his point was more to what he said in the second half of his statement where he talked about the nuance, the ambiguity, where everything isn't as spelled out as you necessarily would need it to be if you're launching a franchise, right? So with The Empire Strikes Back, Ryan Johnson, you can see that that would be a film that would influence Johnson in directing episode eight. So these are the exact kind of comments I want to hear. Adam Driver did a great job of walking the line between not uh, insulting the film that had just come, even though it seems like his character might lend himself more to a darker film. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to get in episode eight if these comments are any legit. Schnepp? Yeah, I love the comments. I mean, whether he tried backpedaling or not, I mean, all of us were kind of conjecturing when we first heard Ryan Johnson. We know he's a sweaty, he's a science yeah. fiction fan, he's a Star Wars fan. All of his films that he's written are great. So we knew that he's a great screenwriter, very competent director, very excited to see him part of this, This, you know, hey, we've got somebody who really knows what's going on in the Star Wars universe. So to, to hear that this is going to be the middle Empire Strikes Back version, we've all been kind of thinking that anyway and hearing someone who's actually in the film and has shot the film saying that to me is great to hear. I don't care if he's backpedaling. We, I want to know more about Kylo Ren. What's he going to do? 
Well, what? here's what's really interesting, too, is what happened to The Empire Strikes Back is we got to see just how evil and menacing Darth Vader can be. Yeah. What happened to the end of Return of the Jedi? Well, hey, he's, he's redeemed. Mm. It, could that be the same arc as Kylo Ren? I certainly don't think that could happen because of what he did to his daddy. Yeah. But maybe there is something that happens in Episode Eight. There's a kernel of a change with Adam Driver's character, Kylo Ren. We don't know yet, but I think these comments indicate we're going to see some more character development from well, him. Well, if they do follow a pattern, and Adam, let's bring up the... Uh, the the great spoiler alert uh, thing there. If they do follow the pattern, in Empire Strikes Back, Han Solo gets <laughs> captured by Boba Fett and That's taken right. away at the end. All 30 right, years ago. 30 years ago today. <laughs> didn't want yeah. to give right. anything away. Yeah. Yeah, so if they did, could that, if, if they were, and again, total long ball speculation here, could we expect to see some sort of significant tragedy happened. I mean, look, we had three major planets blown up in the first one, so yes, tragedy, but could we see something on a character level like what happened to Han in the second episode? Could that happen in this one? Could one of these characters actually die? Could one of these characters actually, could Rey fall to the dark side? I mean, are they are they going to do that? Are we going to see something really bad happen to forget the universe as a whole, but to one specific character? What do you think, Schnapp? Definitely. I mean, keeping in the Star Wars canon of having the middle film, something very traumatic or you know, dire happening that triggers the third film. I, I certainly hope so. Here's where you take to Vegas, and Lord knows I haven't been on fire with betting recently, <laughs> is that BB-8 is not going to be harmed at all. BB-8 is going to be good to go. I think that Poe Dameron might be a guy to look out for. Oh, he could be the, yeah, uh, the carbonite did... freeze of mm. this new trilogy. I, I wouldn't say Finn because he's already been through so much just at the end of that last He's movie. getting a bad deal, man. Yeah. Finn is getting a... Yeah, like, I'd like to see him He's stuck kinda... in the friend zone. <laughs> he takes a lightsaber to the spine. Yeah. This dude's got it rough. You just don't hurt Chewie, and you don't heard BB-8 and we're going to be okay. All right, let's move on. What's next? Director J.A. Bayona was recently doing press at TIFF 2016 for his critically acclaimed Monster Calls when Collider Steve Weintraub asked about the progress on his next project, Jurassic World 2. Though we couldn't reveal much, Bayona did confirm that his film is the second part of a planned trilogy that was set up with Colin Trevorrow's first movie. He also said that they are currently writing the film and are expecting to begin shooting toward the beginning of 2017. Jurassic World 2 is scheduled to hit theaters on June 22, 2018. Mark, what do you think about Jurassic World 2 as the second movie in a planned trilogy? It makes all the sense in the world, both financially and also from a storytelling perspective, because I do want to see what Bayona does with this, but you would want to see more adventures in this universe that I thought was brilliantly set up again in Jurassic World. Now, some people want to write that film off as a popcorn movie. I think there's a lot of stuff to explore in there, but my other issue is that I don't know that Jurassic World lent itself to a sequel necessarily in the first place. That was my one problem, is that it seemed like they tried to create cram in some of that corporate stuff and make us feel like there could be more movies. So Bayona's task is tough making another sequel or making a sequel to Jurassic World. Once he sets that up, I think they're going to be very smart about not closing the door entirely and making it at least another movie have a potential to be happening in this world. There's an interesting rumor that was out a little while ago, and this, this might fit into what we're seeing happening now. The rumor was basically that um, near the end of Jurassic World, Kingpin steals all the, you know, the the, right. the mini di the DNA mm -hmm. plans and the eggs and all that kind of stuff. So there was this theory out there and a rumor that maybe the next Jurassic World movie was going to focus on the military now breeding dinosaurs for military applications. If that's true, we have no idea if that's true or not, but if it were true... There's a two-story arc there. There's a yeah. two-movie arc there for sure. First of all, with the development of them, and then what do they... Obviously, something's going to go bad. <laughs> and once it does go bad, how do they deal with it at that point? Look, you can say, though, that you have a planned trilogy, and that's all fine and good. Aragon had a planned trilogy with John Malkovich and Jeremy mm -hmm. Irons. They planned that thing to be three movies. But what happened? The third one was the best, right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? The movie flopped. The critics hated it. The fans hated it. Nobody wanted to go see it. So you can say you've got a planned trilogy all you want. And it's great that Jurassic World made all the money in the world. Reality is, if the second one comes out and say it makes south of $100 million or something, and it won't happen, the next Jurassic movie is going to make a ton of money. But 
And for whatever reason, it flopped. And that, that's great. You can say you got a planned trilogy, but that's going to go away pretty fast. I don't know. Schnepp, what do you think? Yeah, arming dinosaurs. I was just thinking, like, is the T Rex <laughs> riding the nuclear uh, rocket like a surfboard? <laughs> or has it got, toys? like, mounted uh, weapons on its fa head? Remember you know? those toys in the 80s? There were, like, dudes riding dinosaurs. Yeah. And the dinosaurs had huge heavy dinosaurs armor. had a couple of missile think, applications. Does anybody yeah. remember Dino the riders. name? Was that what it was? No, but it sounds like if it should be. If any of you guys in the chat know what the <laughs> yeah. toys were talking about, fire them in. And, and the, the guys are monitoring the chat or let us know what it was but I yeah lo i love the idea of uh militarizing dinosaurs uh making making them uh, weapons for mankind to use <laughs> hopefully there's some kind of subterranean where they're growing the dinosaurs maybe in iowa you know what i mean it's like iowa. some like there's a hundred thousand dinosaurs underneath us and they just erupt out of the ground i don't know it sounds cool to me it sounds like tremors that, that would be like awesome dinosaur tremors yeah right what if they tie the universes together and that's where tremors that actually come incredible from. all right all right, folks. Well, it is Tuesday, which means it's time for us to talk about what is opening this week, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. There's a few wide release films. We're going to talk about one in particular right now. So, Ashley, what are we talking about? It's The Blair Witch. After discovering a video showing what he believes to be his sister's experiences in the demonic woods of The Blair Witch, James and a group of friends head to the forest in search of his lost sibling. Uh, you look, this Blair Witch was one. And by the way, you were right. It was Dino Riders. Huh. It, it, it seems to be Dino just, Riders is what we're getting. I was what we're getting about it, was, it, but I remember. But you Dino actually Riders, nailed yeah. it. Um, yeah, it was funny because at nobody was talking about Blair Witch again. And this little horror movie was coming out called The Woods that really not many people, except for those really keyed into the horror genre, had even heard about or were looking forward to. It was uh, some like throwaway movie. Mm -hmm. And then at Comic-Con, they dropped, I, I think, the biggest, the biggest surprise I've ever remembered happening at Comic-Con, which was, oh, by the way, that little movie, The Woods, it's the new Blair Witch movie, and we're screening it tonight. And the people saw it, and people came out, and they were raving about it. I got to tell you, I look, I liked the first Blair Witch movie. I remember going into it and enjoying it, thinking, wow, this was a different take. It's been done a million times since. But at the time, when that first Blair Witch came out, it was new. It was creative. We hadn't really seen something like that before in a wide-release motion picture. They made the movie for about $48, and it made like almost $300 million worldwide. Yeah. It was crazy. I have not been excited for anything Blair Witch related since. I mean, the second film was just atrocious. But for whatever reason, when they dropped this announcement that this new movie was a return to Blair Witch, I got excited. I saw that first trailer. I thought the trailer was great. I'm hearing all the fans who have seen it talking about it. That's getting me more excited. So I'm really looking forward to this one, Mark. Yeah, sometimes there's a charm about unexpected sequels. You know, like obviously something like The Force Awakens is like we couldn't believe, oh, sweet, we're getting new Star Wars movies. Then you have something like Rocky Balboa, which is a sequel we never thought we were going to see. We weren't yeah. sure we wanted to. Ended up being a great film. Blair Witch, as soon as they announced that, that that's what this movie was, everybody just had that thought like, Oh yeah, we could totally, we didn't even think that they were going to be building off the, the mythology of Blair Witch 2, Book of Shadows. We knew yeah. that this was going to be going back to a found footage spectacle that was building off the, the mythology and the lore of the first one. It makes total sense to go back into this because John, as you said, found footage has been done to death since Blair Witch. Yeah. So the techniques have also been perfected and crafted better than what they had way back in 99 when that movie came out. So I'm looking forward to the advent of found footage technology telling this story that helped originate found footage technology. I am so excited for this movie, and we get to see it tonight. Yes, we do. Schnepp. Yeah, the Blair Witch Project gave me my best prank I've ever pulled on a friend. And honestly, <laughs> like, I was ready to see The Woods. I'm still ready to see that movie. But Adam and Simon, they're a great duo, and they do, they've do they worked a lot in the found footage realm. So having them take this Blair Witch Project sequel to the next level, and you forget about Book of Shadows, like, let's what happened to that orgy videotape? Oh, wait, we killed each other? <laughs> Spoilers. You don't want to see that movie anyway. Go see Blair Witch. So you told your friend that, that you were just going to see this thing in no, the No, no, no. I got an advanced copy copy from Sundance before Blair Witch Project ever came out and I had an avid I was editing oh, you so I cut the I cut the credits out and just told a friend of mine somebody's got this uh, like I, I don't know what the, is this real should I call the cops and I left him and pressed play and I listened I went downstairs and I listened to him start screaming at the end he's like snap snap what the hell is this he came running down the stairs his face was white he's like we gotta call the cops and I was like I almost peed my pants laughing so hard I was like it's a movie because so I just cut the credits out so it ends with that person in the corner and the camera shaking and screaming. <laughs> that 
<laughs> Almost gave that guy a heart attack, man. It was awesome. I was curious, Ashley. You've seen all the uh, the the build up to this. Yeah, is this I one have. you're looking forward to? I remember seeing the Blair Witch. I didn't see it in theaters, but I saw like five years later on DVD at home. And I love horror movies. This was one horror movie that like legitimately scared me. I'm still scared to watch it to this day, and I'm so excited for this movie. And I think that um. How did they do this? Because everyone was so over found footage, but everyone is so hyped mm -hmm. for this movie. And I think Perry saw it and she said it was great. I'm like really excited that they're continuing on with the original story, so I can't wait to see it. Yeah, we're gonna go see it tonight, so I'm I'm really I'm excited. Hey, I'm excited if, to see if, it. If the shaky cam makes you puke, do it on this jersey. <laughs> 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 All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ashley's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's gonna run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply gonna say whether we buy it. Or salt. So, Ashley, what do we got? The first Red Band trailer for Ben Wheatley's upcoming crime film, Free Fire, has been released. The story centers on a broker Irishman and a gang who are thrust into survival when shots are fired during a transaction of guns, forcing them all to band together to survive. The movie stars Brie Larson, Army Hammer, Charlotte Copley, and Killian Murphy. The movie is still waiting an official release date. Schnapp, buy or sell the first trailer for Free Fire. I buy it, and I buy it mainly because it's Ben Wheatley. I love all of his films. I know High Rise, you know, had give or takes with a lot of people. I thought it was great. I love Sightseers. I love Kill List. I think the guy's a great director, writer. So I, I'm I'm happy to see anything he does. And when I saw this trailer, it looks like a lot of fun. It just looks like an ultra violent, super extra violent Reservoir Dogs. Just saw everything is in one set, and people are just shooting at each other for an hour and a half. I, that sounds exciting to me because I haven't seen a film like that. So I can't wait to see it. I buy this trailer. It's very rare that you come across movies that try to, be, at least mostly try to be in real time. Mm -hmm. And that's an incredibly difficult thing to pull off. I gotta tell you, this trailer hit me from out of nowhere and I loved it. Big buy for me. I thought it looked like it's gonna have a really great kind of like that torrid pace to it. It looks like it's gonna be really fun and funny yet violent all the same time. I love this cast because like, okay, you know what? Lone Ranger aside, I think Army <laughs> Hammer is a hell of an actor. Yeah, I really do. I think great. he's really damn good. You got Murphy, you got Larson, you got Copley in there who I love. I think he's amazing. I just, this had like, a little bit of a lock, stock, and two smoking barrels, totally. a little bit of snatch kind of feel to it, a little Guy Ritchie kind of flavor to it. I think the trailer looked amazing. I'm excited for it for me, a big buy. Yeah, you know, Ted Nugent may be a dangerously insane human being, but he can score a trailer. I love the pairing <laughs> of that music with what this action was. And I cheated a little bit because I have a Twitter feed, and I saw all the people raving about this movie mm. coming out of TIFF. Seeing this trailer for the first time blew me away. Another movie that came into my head, along with the ones you guys mentioned, is that movie Shoot 'em Up that didn't wasn't quite as good as I wanted I it to be. I quite like Shoot 'em Up, But it's though. got that vibe, too. Yeah. You know, this is just a fun time at the movies. You can just turn your brain off. I'm sure there's going to be some sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, different plot lines that are going to be weaving together during this free-for-all. But I loved watching this trailer. I think the cast is tremendous. I'm very excited now about Free Fire. All right, what's next? The first trailer for Fifty Shades Darker has been released. The sequel to Fifty Woo! Shades of Grey is the <laughs> second adaptation of the E.L. James novel and features returning stars Jamie Dornan and Dakota Johnson, with original director Sam Taylor Johnson being replaced <coughs> by James Foley. The film will debut in theaters on February 10th, 2017. John Byer saw the first trailer for Fifty Shades Darker. All right. <laughs> I buy it. Hold on to your hats. <laughs> Before you start, you know, checking to see what day of the week it is and if hell is frozen over. I, I will sometimes say, like, I, I still to this day contend that while the second trailer to Interstellar was amazing. I remember that second trailer for Interstellar came out, blew my socks off. Mm -hmm. But I remember the first, that first teaser they put out, I didn't like it as a trailer. And I challenged some friends of mine, I said, look, take away the fact that you know it's Christopher Nolan doing it. Let's say th this just was a trailer that dropped and you saw it. You don't think it's all that good, but because you know it's Christopher Nolan's new one, you get a little bit more hype. You're for talking it. about the cornfields? Yes. They, they play the straight up cornfield <laughs> exactly. trailer. Everyone's right? crying. It's Christopher Nolan's. It's cornfields. Relax. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think we, we do, and that's normal. That's a totally understandable. That's normal for us to do as human beings. When I sat down and watched this trailer, I said, okay, take out the fact that this is the sequel to a bad first movie. I did not like the first one, I thought it was a pretty poor movie. Take that out of it for a second. Pretend it's not Fifty Shades. Pretend the Fifty Shades label isn't on it mm. and just watch a trailer. And I don't know how it affected either of you guys. I'm saying for me personally, I watched it and went, you know what? Take, take off the label. Take out the fact that I know that the first movie was terrible. Just as a trailer, 
I gotta say, I thought it was a pretty well-constructed trailer. If this was a trailer that just dropped out of nowhere with no other background to it, I would probably go, I'm curious about this movie. Looks, This looks interesting. So, look, I believe the movie's probably gonna be terrible. Absolutely, all that kind of stuff. But if I'm gonna call it like I saw it, just on the trailer alone, I thought they didn't do a bad job. So, oh, while it pains me to say it, I gotta give it a buy, schnep. No, I absolutely sell this horrible <laughs> piece of trash. Um, I don't know what drugs you were on when you were watching this trailer, but I want heavy, a lot of them. Can drugs. I have all of them? You know, I didn't see I didn't see the first Bondage classic, but uh, this one I was like, all right, you know, I'll check out the trailer. I think Dakota Johnson is an incredible actress. She's been in a lot of other films since this mm -hmm. one that I thought she was great in. I don't know what to make of this trailer. That's why I'm selling it. Like, I didn't see the first film, but I was just watching the trailer, and I don't know what the story is. It's like they're on a boat. She's seeing duplicate doppelgangers of herself. Is this... Is she, I don't know what it's about. I literally, it looked really well. Like, I think they got a great DP. It's written by the same person who wrote the original book, and she wrote this screenplay, and her husband's directing it, so I can't, I'm sure it's a knockout Academy Award winning film. The DP did a great job with this trailer. That's all I really have to say about it. Mark? Uh, John, I had some extenuating circumstances <laughs> watching this trailer for the very first time because uh, I was wearing a mask, as was <laughs> Ashley Mova. We watched it together. We had an experience. <laughs> You had some adjusting. There was some adjusting that <laughs> happened in various parts of my body. I will say, that, by the way, you guys can see the reaction soon on Collider Video's YouTube channel right now. I'm going to buy it, too. I'm going to wow, buy I thought I'd be the, only one. the trailer, and I'll tell you why. It's because I agree with everything Schnepp said about the potential of the movie, but judging it just based off the trailer, Ash and I were actually laughing at the beginning of the trailer. The, the first thing you see is it says, forget <laughs> the past. And it's like, they know they made a bad movie the first time, mm. so they're trying to wipe Damn. our memory. They're trying to men in black mind erase us, and it worked to the point where it looks like a darker, more mysterious, more suspenseful game of sexual intrigue, which is really all this movie's trying to do. So it looked like the best version of what the 50 shades franchise can do now it's not anything that i'm going to be lining up for to see valentine's day but i think that for what this movie is for the material that it has this was a well done trailer so i am going to buy the trailer even though the movie's probably going to be smelly i don't know danny might want, might want you to go see she, it with her on valentine's she day she probably wants to see it less than i do <laughs> but i will be bringing the masks opening day yeah. ashley you uh, you did the trailer reaction with mark i, I did and i haven't asked you what did you think of the I trailer did. you know um, Mark texted me this morning saying that we're going to do a trailer review and uh, I was trying to think of lies that I was going to construe <laughs> during the review um, because I, I hated the first one. I really did hate the first one. Um, but I think that they listened to everyone's reactions to the first movie and they're trying to adjust it because they're like incorporating a thriller aspect in here. Right. Um, is this her ghost? Is this like her conscience trying to say something to her? Is this really a third person? I'm intrigued. I have to say I'm intrigued. Uh, my expectations aren't really high, but I am intrigued. So will, all three of you buy it. I like they, uh, them yeah. buying it. Now intrigued me to maybe this watch the trailer a second time and still hate it. <laughs> I will quote the text. It says, "Guess who gets to do a Fifty Shades Darker trailer review with me?" <laughs> question mark. Question mark. Question mark. Question mark. Question mark. And then she writes back, "Um, Avi, me. I'll bring the masks and this terrible soundtrack." I have to ask. Closer. Did she say Avi? She said Avi in all caps. <laughs> oh yeah. Come on, guys. Bam. Come on. <laughs> All right, let's go into our last buy or sell okay. of the day. <laughs> Hot off its Midnight Madness premiere at TIFF 2016, the James Gunn written and produced The Belco Experiment has landed an acquisition deal thanks to Orion and BH Till. The film is directed by Greg McLean and tells the story about a deadly social experiment that sees a group of 80 Americans locked inside a high-rise corporate office and given the directive to kill or be killed. It is set to be released on March 17, 2017. Mark Byers saw The Belco Experiment from James Gunn. Ooh, this is why I sell ever working for a giant corporate corporation but it's why i will buy this premise because if james gunn is a good storyteller regardless of what budget or what constraints or what kind of cast he's working with the guy knows how to tell a good story so when i hear something like this it sounds like it's going to be really tough to watch from a uh, human perspective you're going to get nervous you're going to have a lot of anxiety checking this out but it does seem like something that i would want to check out so i'll give it a buy snap 
I'm going to buy it, but why is Gunn holding a Belco experiment script that's spelled B-E-L-C-O, and the movie's called B-E-L-K-O? What movie? Which Belco is it? <laughs> well, they probably had some kind of dude like, you can't use my name. I'm a real company, and I'm Belco with a C. All right, F you. Now it's K. I want to see this movie. I buy the premise. I want to see this battle royale in a horrible corporate environment. This sounds really fun. This is right up Gunn's alley. Remember, he's coming from trauma. He's coming from... He makes film for us. Like, you know, all the films that he's made yeah, he does. are for fans because he's a fan. So I can't wait to see this film. I feel it sounds like when, exciting. Whenever we talk about Gun, I got to plug watch PG porn. Get Just get <laughs> online, search for PG porn, especially yes. the one with Nathan Fillion. Yeah. And it, it's James, because like, you're right, James Gunn makes stuff that he knows him and his buddies would like. And I think a lot of us will fall into that category that we really like the stuff he makes. I buy this. Look, obviously this is really going to be heavily influenced by Battle Royale, which if you haven't seen Battle Royale, it's, it's classic. If you yeah. want to see brutal, shocking fights that also influenced movies like Hunger Games and things like that. Right. Check out Battle Royale. It looks really cool. But there was also a episode of Gotham. For, for those of you who watch Gotham, there was an episode of Gotham this year that was surrounding this guy, this corporate owner, who would hire a bunch of Guys to work in, Wait in a second, Gotham, the thing that doesn't have Batman in yes, it, right? Yes, the show okay. that does not have well, Batman. he's got Batman, but he's a kid. But he's a child yeah, at right, this point, yeah. Right. And it's got an episode where all this, this owner, this boss, makes all of his corporate lackeys fight to the death in the corporate environment, wow. which sounds a little bit similar to this. Look, but it's James Gunn is attached to it, so I'm excited about it. The reviews coming out of TIFF have been huge, so I'm super excited. Big buy for me. All right, folks. Well, listen, it is September, which means now we're moving to that last season of the movie year. It is the fall movie season, and quite often you get some of your best movies of the year are released in the fall. John Schnepp and I recently did a little fall movie preview on our other show, Film HQ, so we thought instead of just rehashing the whole thing, we would just share that segment with you now. So here's some of the movies that we are looking forward to this fall. Let's take it away. So as we finish this summer movie season, it's time to look ahead to what the fall has in store for the movie fans out there. We're gonna tell you about 14 films we're anticipating most before the end of 2016. Hey, let's start with the uh, September releases. Not only is it including Sully, which we just talked about, we've got Blair Witch. It premieres September 16th. It's directed by Adam Wingard. The story follows James, a college student who convinces his friends to trek into the woods with him to find his lost sister, Heather, the main character from the original Blair Witch Project. Hey, James, just stay at home and play video games. What's wrong with you? Your sister's dead. <laughs> the Magnificent Seven is coming. Antoine Fuqua directs a remake of the 1960 classic, which shoots its way into theater September 23rd. It stars Denzel Washington and Chris Pratt. This could be better than Hell or High Water. Man, that's a high mark to reach, man. Reach. Hell or High Water, go see that in the theaters. Deepwater Horizon, it blows up the Gulf of Mexico <laughs> on September 30th. Peter Berg directs this true story behind the explosion on the offshore oil rig responsible for the largest oil spill in U.S. history. Mark Wahlberg, Marky Mark, leads the cast as they try and convince the world that the oil spill wasn't that bad. Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, directed by Tim Burton, rounds out the month of September on the 30th. This movie, to me, is probably the most anticipated film from Tim Burton I can even remember. Same here. It's Tim Burton's X-Men. I can't wait to see this. Now, on to October, which is three movies I've been patiently, or maybe not so patiently, waiting to see since the first trailers were released. First one off the list, The Girl on the Train, starring Emily Blunt and directed by Tate Taylor, who also directed The Help, premieres on October 7th. The movie is an adaptation of a best-selling novel that looks a lot like a husband's worst nightmare. <laughs> the Accountant balances the illegal checkbook starting October 14th. Gavin O'Connor directs this thriller, and the early buzz is that it's an Oscar-worthy performance by Ben Affleck, as a forensic accountant uncooking the books for illicit clients. I can't wait for the Akutin, thanks Josh McCooka, <laughs> to come out. Jack Reacher, never go back. That's coming back against better advice on October 21st. Edward Zwick, who did The Last Samurai, directs Tom Cruise in the second installment of the Jack Reacher franchise. Did we need another Jack Reacher movie? I think Werner Herzog thought we did. I want another one. I, I like want, the yeah. first one. Moving on to November, where Marvel makes their big splash on the season, along with a few other mythical creatures. Let's 
get into it. Mm. Doctor Strange, yeah. Marvel's latest sure to be blockbuster, lands in theaters on November 4th. Directed by Scott Derrickson, who is best known for writing Sinister, helms the psychedelic, mind-bending movie starring Benedict Cumberbatch, Rachel McAdams, and Tilda Swinton. I don't know if Doctor Strange could be the next billion-dollar Marvel franchise, but I'm excited to see just how strange it really gets. Teach me! <laughs> we also got Hacksaw Ridge, Mel Gibson's first directorial effort since Apocalypto, which I love, premieres the same weekend on November 4th. This war drama stars Andrew Garfield as a war medic and received a 10-minute standing ovation at the Venice Film Festival. The buzz for this movie is unreal. Totally. Arrival arrives in theaters on November 11th. Sicario director Denis Villeneuve and stars Amy Adams, Jeremy Renner, and Forrest Whitaker have to figure out the alien egg-like ships and what exactly they want. Someone call Bill Pullman and get some advice. I certainly hope this is better than uh, Regurgence or whatever that one was called. <laughs> Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them accidentally releases Creatures of the Night into theaters on November 18th. David Yates, who directed the last four Harry Potter movies, will helm the first spin-off franchise of the Billion Dollar Property, which stars Eddie Redmayne as Newt Scamander. Now, those are some big robes to fill. Anything involving Harry Potter has got to be big. And finally, we get to December, where even Santa Claus is taking some time off to see Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Mm. December has a few other big hitters, but let's start with Rogue One, yeah. a Star Wars story. <laughs> Stealing the plans for the Death Star is my most anticipated opening on December 16th. Gareth Edward directs the first ever non-Sega movie in the Star Wars universe, and just like that, thousands of voices screams out all at once, Thank you! We've also got another video game adaptation. Assassin's Creed tries to take some of that Star Wars buzz on December 21st when unknown director Justin Kurtzall tries to make a great video game adaptation, something that appears to be quite difficult, <laughs> but with Michael Fassbender in the starring role, I've got high hopes. Passengers rounds out our list, directed by the Imitation Games' Morton Tilden and starring Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence, hits theaters on December 21st. Nothing like ending the year on a post-apocalyptic space movie. Totally. And of course, you can catch uh, John and mine's show, Film HQ, on Comic-Con HQ every Saturday. Make sure you check that out. All right, guys, listen. Movie talk is not the only thing that's on Collider Video today. We got a few other things coming, including a brand new episode of Nightmares. John Schnepp is on that panel yeah. with, with a few other people around here at Collider. It's a yeah, great show. Riley, uh, hosted by Clark Wolf. Perry's on it, getting all into the brand new horror stuff. So, so And awesome. also, today's the first team match for the new team division of the Schmodown Movie Trivia Competition. And we've got the Patriots versus the mega powers of Josh McCuga and Finstock. This should be an wow. interesting one. Make sure you guys check that out a little bit later today. And of course, tomorrow, Heroes is on tomorrow. That's right. We can we can be heroes if just for on Wednesday. <laughs> if just for one day. Yeah. And hey, listen, guys, we do this show live right now. So if you guys are watching us live at this moment right now, you can start sending in some Twitter questions to us. Make sure you're following us at Collider Video. Start firing out some Twitter questions, and Wendy will pick out some questions we'll ask at the end of the show. But for now, let's get to our mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Ashley, you got a question for today. I do. Philippe Barros Pexoto, right? It's more often wow. than not. I nice. hear you guys talking about how studios usually get in the way of the creative process, production, and direction of a movie. So my first question is, do you think that lacks professionalism? I mean, the studios should have more capable people to intervene or not when necessary. My second question, could you cite an example that the studio's intervention was essential otherwise the movie would bomb? Well, uh, look, I, I said this on my social media the other day, and I hold true to this. Every studio gets involved with their movies, all right? Don't forget, this is their movie. We like to think it's the directors. No, 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 no. The movie belongs to the people who pay for it. If you owned a house and you hired a designer to come and design your house, you want to let the designer do their thing, but at the same time, you're going to make damn well sure it's what you want because it's your house and you're paying the bills. Mm -hmm. So that happens with movies, and that's understandable. It happens with all the movies. The only thing is, when it turns out bad, we call it interference. When it turns out good, we call it collaboration. <laughs> it all depends on how the movie turns out. Now, you asked a really good question about, can you think of like a real heavy time that studios got heavily involved, You know, maybe toss a director on a good, yeah, man, World War Z. I mean, World War Z is the poster child for that. That mm. movie was turning out to be a hot, bloody mess. The studio stepped in, they kind of tore the whole thing apart. They reshot 
forget a little. They reshot two thirds of the movie, right. completely reconstructed it, and what happened? The movie was a hit after that, and it turned out well. That happens. You know, I point to um, Peter Jackson a lot because Peter Jackson does a really good talk on how he worked with the studio and the studio was constantly giving him notes and he talked about the great collaboration. Joss Whedon talks very often about working with Marvel and working with the studio where they sometimes veto things he wanted to do and he's like, hey man, turns out that was the best thing for it. Filmmaking is a collaborative effort. It's just that, you know, when the movie turns out bad, we want to point at the man and say, it's their fault. Right. And sometimes it is. Sometimes it's totally their fault, but it's not always because it is a collaborative effort. I mean, Schnepp, as a guy who's worked from the creative process on that side of it a lot, how would you answer this question? Well, I also, I'll look at it from the flip side too. I remember studios have fostered helping like, oh, the, the movie's in trouble. Let's throw more money at it. Let's yes. try to get that vision there. Think about Heaven's Gate if you've never seen it. That movie started out as like I think a $17 million movie, ended up costing $75 million, <laughs> came out two and a half years later and was a, gi a gigantic box office bomb. Not only destroyed the director's career for many, many, many years, of which he never fully recovered, but it also hurt the studio because that's a lot of money, especially back then. So obviously it's a studio picture. A studio's putting millions of dollars not only into making the film, but promoting the film. So we've seen just recently some retconning or, you know, hey, let's let's refigure this with the Justice League. You know, we saw right. there was a reaction to Man of Steel, and then there was a reaction to Batman v Superman, and even after that, a reaction to Suicide Squad. So what with that bigger reaction to Batman v Superman, they made a course correction. Now all the sets and everything, all the pre-production, everything was done and they were shooting, but that didn't mean that they can't change the script to make it a little bit different and change the tone of certain things and address certain things. So I think that's going to be the film that we can point to with this kind of thing where the studio kind of got involved, maybe at the later stage, but in something that they needed to address. Now, Wonder Woman was probably a little too far into the process right. by that time, but still, I'm, I'm really fascinated to see how Wonder Woman turns out. But you're right, I think that first Justice League movie, when it hits we're going to get a real taste of what this new vision and what this new direction is really going to feel like. And hey, if that, that footage that we saw at Comic-Con is any indication, the course correction seems to have worked so far from the limited amount that we did sure. get to I see. I love that trailer. I'm going to get out of my comfort zone here for a minute. I'm going to use a sports reference. So <laughs> if you have the owner of a sports team, they always get criticized when they meddle and it doesn't work out, but you, they never really get their praises sung if they intervene with what's happening with a team and it ends up working out. We usually give the praise to the coach or the players, but there's a lot of circumstances for every fan Fantastic Four you can throw at me, I can give you something like an Ant-Man, for example, where right, maybe Edgar right. Wright's Ant-Man would have been great, and I would love to see that version if it ever came to fruition, but Marvel was not happy with the direction as far as that movie fitting into the greater MCU, so they changed it, they got a new director, and it seems to have worked out pretty well. Mad Max Fury Road had reshoots that were studio-ordered because they wanted some different things in there. George Miller worked with them and it ended up being a freaking yeah, great masterpiece. Example. There's three movies I can think of that I would have loved some more studio interference. Can you name them? Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith. <laughs> I think if you had a little bit of studio meddling in those, right. and you had a True. collaboration with George Lucas instead of letting him be the omnipotent dictator, I think those movies could have turned out a lot better too. So for every time you can throw at me that there's a bad movie because the studio interfered, I can show you some examples when it actually worked out well. It's all about collaborating yeah. and working together to make something great as opposed to playing Jenga with a studio <laughs> versus a director. Right. All right, well listen, I said we'd save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take your Twitter questions and we're gonna do that right now once again don't forget follow us on Twitter at Collider video fire in your questions Wendy's been back there pulling out some of your uh, stuff that you've been sending in so Wendy what do we have Doug Joseph says any movies or acting performances this year that you think deserves a Razzie wondering if we've seen any contenders yet mm. Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you can oh, think of yeah. one? What's Literally everybody that signed up for Independence Day Resurgence. Oh, <laughs> Here's yeah. your Razzie. The movie deserves a Razzie. It, I deserve a Razzie for bringing it up and putting it back into your head for whatever amount of time it's going to stay in there. I hate that movie. Can Next. you give the Siri Orb a Razzie as well, <laughs> whoever played that? I'm ready now. <laughs> you know? Oh, God. Glad you have seen the movie. An another one for me is... Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't hate the movie, but some of the performance is really bad. Look, I'm gonna before. Let me preface this. I think Megan Fox, who a lot of us, including me, have trashed on an awful lot over the years, mostly for good reason. If you've seen her on TV and stuff like that, she's actually finally starting to to develop yeah. and grow as an actress. I think she's getting better. I really do. However, 
Um, her performance in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 out of the showers was probably Razzie worthy. Mm. I thought that was Razzie worthy. And it's a shame because I do see her getting better. But that, that to me was not a good expression. You know who gets a Razzie from me? Uh, the kid, the squire who looks like the doppelganger from Game of Thrones who's in Warcraft. Don't even know his name. Oh, like, yeah. That I was, was like, what that movie is this guy rough. supposed oh, yeah. to be in? A lot of people not, were It's not this him. movie. And that, yeah. that, I felt bad for him, too, because that was a, to me, that was a big case of miscasting. Yeah, it was a full-on. They just, just like, didn't put him in a position to succeed. Yeah. You know what would be interesting is if uh, Jennifer Lawrence could pull Sandra Bullock, where what if she gets nominated for Passengers for an Oscar, <laughs> but then she shows up to collect her Razzie for her performance in X-Men Apocalypse the night before? <laughs> because I don't think she was horrible in X-Men Apocalypse, but there was definitely some, you know, some UPSing going on. I'll, that I'll say it, she was horrible. Okay. She was horrible <laughs> in X-Men Apocalypse. And you know what? And the reason that gets me upset is because she is world class. Yeah. Jennifer Lawrence, mm -hmm. like for those people trash her, I'm sorry. Take a pill. She is world class She's talented. She's awesome. Just which check out Winner's me... Bone, her first yeah. film. It's amazing. Which what is what really ticked me off when I saw her just mail it in for X Men Apocalypse. Like you can just tell from the first frame, she didn't even want to be. I think in that her movie. character was called Ghost Walker in that one. <laughs> Ghost Walker. <laughs> Did you guys see the mall scene from the X Men? Yes, the deleted mm -hmm. one. Yeah. yeah. That's what that when I saw that it hurt a lot because I was like, man, they why did they that cut been that? Fun. That would have you know could have been fun. All right, what else do we got in Twitter? Uh, I would pick the uh, the the candy. Candy Bar Girl, also from the Purge election year. Oh, yes! Yeah. She was so Come bad. On, Where's my candy? candy? Yeah. Oh. You kids with your purging. I don't, I don't purge. Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, Spider Hawk says, in honor of the start of the NFL season, what is your favorite football movie? I enjoy the replacements and any given Sunday. Wow. There are some really good ones out there. Um, Burt Reynolds. Longest Yard. The Longest Yard yeah. um, has to probably rank right up there. That's my all-time favorite. And what was the one? You know what? Every, no, everybody's forgotten about it. Gene Hackman, Keanu Reeves. The replacement. That was the replacement. Sorry, and that yeah. was based on the true story bad. of the 1987 Washington Redskins who went on to win the Super Bowl that year, Super Bowl 22. Doug Williams was the MVP of that game. That's back when the Redskins were playing some football. I like <laughs> The Goon with Stifler. I that was hockey. Wait to see. What is he he's talking about? Football? Football, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sports suck it sports. here's what's weird is it usually with sports movies in general but particularly with football it's a lot harder to find a film about professional football that is up to the quality of either a high school movie like remember the titans which is great or, or a college football movie what about rudy? friday night lights friday night lights is rudy? a great high rudy rudy's a great John college Favreau. football yeah. movie but when you get to the professional ranks you can have something like heaven can wait with warren Beatty's. okay right. you can have i mean it, it, any given sunday is about professional football very very different league with the Miami Sharks and I any given Sunday has aged not that well and it's not that great of an Oliver Stone film but there's a scene between Lawrence Taylor LT from the New York Giants and Jamie Foxx's quarterback yeah. in that and it's really good LT's got some acting oh wait jobs. I got it I got it what's that one with the rock where he plays the uh he, he's he finds out he's got a daughter Oh yeah, it's uh, he's, got, it's, he's got his football jersey on and a ballerina tutu. Yeah, I cannot it's remember. It's not coming to me. It's hey, I'm glad wait. this is not the Schmodown. Can't right believe now. I can't remember the name. I can't this remember is the best that. Movie can ever. you guys remember the one with Joe Namath? Uh, Joe Namath. Joe Namath no. was in a football. That's right. Joe Namath was in a football. That's movie. one of my favorite '70s style ones. It's so funny that a quarterback from the New York Jets was in a football movie, and then they got a guy who's not a quarterback for the New York Jets to play a New York Jets QB in Flash Gordon. Oh. Why wasn't Joe Namath <laughs> in Flash right. Gordon? Damn. All right, what else do we got? All right, Sexy Butterstick says, Hey, crew, looking sexy as usual. What is your favorite food-related movie? Mine is probably Chef or Ratatouille. Thanks. Sexy Butterstick. Ratatouille, yeah. it, Ratatouille is marvelous. And then what was that one... Um, that was out last year with Helen Mirren, uh, thousand. Oh, the hundred foot. The hundred uh, foot journey, journey or yeah. a thousand oh. foot journey. One of the two. Really, an underrated little mm -hmm. film. I thought that was really good. And then there was that one with Aaron Eckhart and uh, oh, Catherine, Catherine Zeta Jones. Yeah. And I cannot. It was, it was a, innocent enough, just a little kind of like rom com based around food. Which, but Chef was. Chef was great, but Ratatouille all time. You mentioned is my number Helen one food Mirren. Movie. I'm going to talk about. Let's go into the way back machine. Helen Mirren in the cook. The thief, her wife, his wife, and her lover. Incredible food That's film. Going Peter Greenaway. Way back. It's going way back, but w just watch that food. It's both disgusting and delicious, and it's incredible. <laughs> and Helen Mirren is damn sexy in that film. I think She's Julie sexy today. and Julia has got, has got a lot of good stuff too. The, the story about Julia oh, Child with Meryl totally. Streep. Yes. In it. That's really good. And then if I mean, look, basically we're talking about food porn. What's the best food porn Tam out Popo. there? Tampopo. 
Tam Popo, remember I would that go one? Nine and a half weeks. There's some very interesting uh, food related scenes in that film. Maybe it's <laughs> just because I just saw the Fifty Shades Darker trailer, but watch Nine and a Half Weeks. That's good food porn. All right, let's take two more. All right, uh, Matthew Anderson says, "What movie sparked your love for cinema the most when you were younger or old? I don't know. Maybe you were a late cinephile bloomer." Star Wars. <laughs> Star Wars. It's, look, I told the story before. It is my earliest childhood memory. Is uh, my mom taking me to see Star Wars? My next earliest childhood memory. I don't have another memory before that than when my aunt Pina took me to see Empire Strikes Back. Mm. And I remember because the first time she took me to, we actually got to the theater late, and we walked into the theater at the point where the Star Destroyer was shooting out the probe droids. Nice. So that's just a couple of minutes in. But by all, but like that set my path for life, was that my first pet was a cat that we named Luke Skywalker. Surprisingly enough, it ran away. Aww. But uh, I mean, I- Came I mean, back with missing a paw. <laughs> We had a cat <laughs> named Luke too. He was an all black cat and he ran away too. Oh, what? Really? Yeah, really? he came back like six months later for two weeks. It was weird. It was like Pet Cemetery, and he was kind of Luke, but he wasn't really Luke anymore. <laughs> what? So maybe Pet that's Cemetery? what's going to happen in episode eight. I don't know what kind of Luke Skywalker we're getting. I, I hate anymore. to break this to you, but your cat died, and your parents got you another one that kind of looked the same. <laughs> oh, and it didn't work <laughs> out. They were like, get happened. rid of it. It's possessed. <laughs> that is not true because my parents were freaked out by new Luke. There's a, <laughs> secret, like too. a secret island of cats with all named Luke. <laughs> they all just like, we must go to this island. Is your name Luke? Yes. You may enter. Come on in. I totally forgot what the question was. Oh, uh, oh movies yeah. that sparked your love for cinema. Yeah, you know, it, like, obviously the Star Wars is in the Jaws and all that stuff like, like made me the, the human yeah. I am today. But I remember being in the theater watching uh, Robert Rodriguez's Desperado. Mm. That was one of wow. the first yeah. times I was just like, man, this action is so well choreographed. There really, there, there's a lot of artistry that goes into making even a fun action movie like what Desperado was. That always stuck with me. I remember just like the few years before Star Wars was like the Poseidon Adventure, Logan's Run. I remember just those films, seeing those films in the theater just made me so excited to go to see movies. Here's a question I'm going to have for everybody, including you, Ashley, but Mark, I want to start with you. The first movie you remember going to without your parents? First movie I remember going to without my parents is uh, a tie between, I don't know which one came out first. It was opening weekend for both. It was either uh, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 6, Freddy's Dead, mm. The Final Nightmare. Wow. Uh, in 3D. Nice. Or Terminator 2, uh, we, me and my friend Matt Wills, we snuck into both of those movies. Because we, you buy another ticket for like a movie we're allowed to go see because they were rated R. Then we snuck in there, had no problem either way, and got our minds blown by both movies. They're fun. Schnapp, which one was the first you went to go see without your parents? Strangely enough, it was Star Wars. My sister took me. I had to give her my uh, weekly allowance. I was because she was like, <laughs> I, I was crying to go see this movie, and so well, your sister can take you. And she's like a year and a half older than me, so. That's the first movie, and of course, I was like, can I have my, my allowance back because you loved it? No. <laughs> uh, for me, it was the all-time classic, the Kenny Rogers film, Six Pack. Yeah! Where Kenny Rogers plays a NASCAR driver, and he picks up these six orphan kids to be his pit crew. <laughs> Wow. You gotta know when to hold them, when to fold them. So this is back when people never thought about a six pack as part of your abs. It was really the rings of a beer. <laughs> yes. So Ashley, I'm just curious, what was the first movie you I went to go see? I want to say it was The Ring, and I was way too young to be in there, and me and my friends were talking too much, and I think we got kicked out. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kicked so out. awkward. <laughs> All right, last Twitter question of the day. All right, Jay Day says, name two people you'd want to survive a zombie apocalypse with. Oh. Um, okay, one would be Steven Spielberg, mm -hmm. because I think even if he's just doing like selfie movies, he could make the best movies I could watch and be entertained awesome. by. And the second is my all-time celebrity crush, Jennifer Garner. Nice. So that's probably be mine. Are these are these people? Can we take people from our lives, or are we just sure. doing the movie universe? No, rock and roll. I think it's Anything. easier just to do the movie universe because I'll probably get a lot of flack if I don't take uh, certain people in real the movie life. universe. <laughs> yeah, Ashley's never gonna forgive me if I don't yeah. take her in the bunker with me. So if you're going strictly into movie universe, I'm gonna go with uh, Jennifer Lawrence's Mystique because um, she can be anything. <laughs> right. She can learn to be anything. You know, sure. you feel like a dude that day. She's a dude. R two D two is the other one. <laughs> R2-D2 is the other one. I'm surviving with R2-D2 and J-Law's Mystique. All right. Well, I was just going with, uh, like, because uh, corporations are people, too, so I was going to take Target and Walmart with me. <laughs> and then I just have frozen You thought food. this out way better yeah. than we did. <laughs> <laughs> you so cheated I know. in your zombie apocalypse. I know. But it's a great answer. 
All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank, first of all, the people sitting at the table with me. Sitting on my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram and check out today's Collider Nightmare and tomorrow's Collider Heroes. Sitting over on my right, the Pittsburgh Steeler loving Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you online? Hey, all the Redskins. Fight for old DC. You guys can find me. I just posted dates for my uh, new LA show at the Comedy Store and then New York City for a Comic Con. Going to be at New York Comedy Club. You can get all the tickets at my website, markelleslive.com. Zach Horton, thanks for the ride this weekend, buddy. Appreciate it. And I. You know what? I forgot to mention that a lot of us are going to be at Long Beach Comic Con. We're doing a Heroes Live panel, John Campia, and the rest of the crew, Jace Inman, Burnett, Chris Gore, a whole bunch of the sweaties who are on Heroes are going to be at Long Beach this coming Saturday, so check it out. And, of course, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. Over there monitoring everything on Twitter is Wendy Lee Zaney. Wendy, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And, of course, you can find me on Facebook and on Twitter simply at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. My name's John Campia, and until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.